doctor Vincent su trayectoria a través de, a, a través de, la, de, la, de, la, de, de sus estudios se, se recibió como médico Magna Cum Laude. <risa> Magna Cum Laude. Luego se hizo medicina interna, es internista y luego hizo la unidad, hizo cuidado intensivo. El doctor eh, Benson, cuando hizo cuidado intensivo, pues hizo dos años de fellowship como un maestro de maestros el profesor de profesores que era Mark Harry Wells ¿sí? ¿No? nuestro gran profesor Mark Harry Wells él estudió con Mark Harry Wells en el sur de California entonces el doctor Vincent actualmente es secretario de la Federación Mundial de Sociedades de Medicina Crítica es presidente de la Sociedad Europea, Sociedad Europea de Cuidados Intensivos y es uh, director, uh, director de, varios, de, de, varias, de varias revistas, incluyendo Critical Care, director of Critical Care, eh, de, 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 director y chef <risa> así que la, el doctor ha recibido muchos, muchísimos premios como gran investigador como gran, como gran clínico y su área más importante de investigación ha sido la que nos ha motivado a traerlo acá que es la falla circulatoria que es el shock la, la disponibilidad de oxígeno, la entrega de oxígeno, todas estas cosas que él ha investigado a lo largo de, de, a lo largo de estos años, por lo cual ha recibido muchos premios. El doctor dice es un gigante, un gigante, no por el tamaño, un gigante de la medicina crítica. Y nos bueno, enorgullece mucho tenerlo aquí, el doctor Vincent, y, y esperamos escuchar su, su charla sobre la correlación de los diferentes del de, 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 de consumo de oxígeno, saturación de oxígeno, saturación central de nota de oxígeno y la saturación tisular de oxígeno en la etapa inicial del shock séptico. Muchas gracias, muchas gracias. And thank you very, very much for uh, such uh, a kind uh, presentation, but also for such a kind uh, invitation. I'm very, very pleased to be with you in Panama, and it's really uh, great to be uh, in such a nice uh, atmosphere. Many thanks to Guadalupe for having invited me here. Uh, it, it, it's a real pleasure. So, indeed, <clears throat> I was asked to uh, speak about, well, yeah, allow me to bring the, the best regards from our World Federation uh, of uh, Intensive and Critical Care Societies. So I was asked to refer to the Surviving Sepsis Campaign Guidelines, and you could read these guidelines that we wrote um, and published uh, recently. I mean, the update was published a few months ago. And I will indeed particularly touch on uh, the oxygen, the oxygen aspect of uh, the management of the critically ill with, uh, with sepsis. But I'd like also to emphasize what guidelines are about. Because today we see guidelines about everything, they've got guidelines about Uh, illnesses, guidelines about uh, medical problems, surgical problems, and um, it's important to read these guidelines, um, but it's important to realize that it's not some kind of Bible, it's, uh, it's some kind of a summary of the literature, an update of the literature, 
and uh, we still need to interpret the results and try to think before we uh, apply uh, protocols. And indeed, I'd like to start with, um, with the syndrome of, of shock. Shock is a state between life and death. It's a situation where the tissues do not receive enough oxygen and do not function properly because oxygen availability is uh, impaired. So we usually recognize shock by the hypotension, but it's not just the hypotension, it's more than that. If we want to see inside the body, what's going on inside the body, it's a little bit like looking inside a house which has been damaged by a natural catastrophe. What can we do? to try to see if we can help some people inside. So we go through and go, we go and see through the windows. And in shock, if we try to appreciate the degree of uh, perfusion of the organs, we will have essentially three windows. One is the skin, we will look at the skin and see how the capillary perfusion is maintained or altered. We will look at the urine output, because if the kidneys are underperfused, urine output will decrease. And we will look at the mentation, the neurological status of the patient. In shock, the patient is not really comatose, no. But there is altered brain perfusion that will be characterized by disorientation, confusion, obtundation, the patient is uh, a bit sleepy, a bit drowsy, and um, does not have a normal mentation. These are the three windows of acute circulatory failure. I would love to look at other organs. Could we look at other organs? I don't know which one. Can you see some other windows of acute, do you have an idea? Another window of acute circulatory failure. We tried to look at the gut in the past with gastric tonometry. Some of you maybe remember, you know, the modified nasogastric tube and we were looking at the perfusion of the gastric mucosa. But there were so many problems with it that we abandoned it. It's not even available anymore. Uh, so these are basically the three windows of acute circulatory failure. But there is one uh, blood test that we could add to it, and that's lactate levels. When the lactate levels are, let's say, above two milliequivalents per liter, or millimoles per liter is the same, um, that can reflect an alteration in uh, cellular metabolism. It's perhaps not always anaerobic metabolism, but it is altered cellular metabolism. So that's it. If we are called on the floor to look at a patient who is hypotensive, let's look at the three windows, the skin, the urine, the brain. Let's measure lactate levels. And if indeed there are no signs of altered tissue perfusion, it's just hypotension, but it's not acute circulatory failure and if blood lactate are increased, then we should actually insert an arterial catheter and probably try to evaluate the uh, cardiac output of the patient. By which technique, the technique you like, uh, you may not use a swan gans catheter, you may perhaps use simply an echocardiography, but it's important then to uh, try to separate the four types of shock that Dr. Weil defined many years ago. The distributive type is typically the type of shock that corresponds to sepsis with a high cardiac output, a hyperkinetic pattern, and then hypovolemic cardiogenic obstructive, which are the three types of shock associated with a low cardiac output. A low cardiac output, a low flow state, it's 
always one of these three mechanisms. Hypovolemia, regardless of the origin, a cardiac problem, perhaps an alteration in contractility or major arrhythmia, or an obstruction, like in severe pulmonary embolism. There is no other mechanism to account for a low flow state. Okay, but regardless of the, uh, of the cause, we would like to restore an adequate blood pressure, if possible without any vasopressors, and then we will hopefully reverse the alteration in tissue perfusion, normal skin perfusion, restore during output, and restored or preserved uh, mental status. And we would like to see the lactate levels going down. I will uh, discuss it in just, uh, in just a moment. So indeed, as we just heard, I was trained by Dr. Weil, who was telling us that every patient is a VIP. <coughs> VIP stands for very important person, of course, but also ventilate infused pump. So start with oxygen therapy, maybe intubate the trachea if needed, then give fluids, then give uh, vasoactivations if needed. When I say then, then sometimes we have to do just three things at the same time, but uh, this is the basis for resuscitation of, uh, of shock states. <coughs> Now, what kind of monitoring system do we need for fluid administration? That's a long story, and we have had many discussions with the surviving sepsis campaign about optimal monitoring systems. Should we measure cardiac output, use a litco pico uh, system? Well, at least we should probably have a central venous catheter in place so that we could give fluids rapidly and measure the cardiac filling pressures. Now, of course, that's a scheme that I like with the two hearts and the single lung. That's our cardiovascular system, in a way. Um, the central venous pressure will be determined by a number of variables. The blood volume, the right heart function, of course, if there is pulmonary hypertension, the central venous pressure may be high, regardless of the volume status. And of course, the left ventricular function may also influence the central venous pressure. So some people say it's meaningless to measure it. I don't think it's meaningless. I think it's very useful. But we need to understand what the central venous pressure represents. Of course, in complex cases, we could go over the lungs or over the uh, pulmonary vessels and directly measure the left-sided filling pressures with the swan gans catheter. That was the idea of Swan and Jans to have a bloated catheter so that we could measure the left-sided filling pressures. But in many patients, we don't need that, of course. Now, we know that just measuring one level of uh, cardiac filling pressures <coughs> may not really tell us very much about the need for fluid administration. You can look at responders, non-responders to fluids. There is not a big difference in, uh, in terms of uh, levels of cardiac filling pressure. And actually, we never like to increase cardiac filling pressures. Do we like to do it? Never. I sometimes hear the resident saying, you know, I gave fluids to raise the central venous pressure to eight or 10. Do you sometimes say that? We should not. We should not. Never. Because 